Welcome to the Claremont County Public Library's Book Lovers Podcast. I'm your host, Laura, and today I'm joined by Shana and Jordan. And I don't know why I look at you guys. It's not like the case, <laughs> but I do every time. So this episode, we're going to share some of our favorite books from 2020. Remember to visit ClaremontLibrary.org for transcripts that will have all of the book titles and links to them in our catalog. So, Sheena, you're up first. Yes. What have you got? So, this book, it wasn't originally part of my top 2020, but then I read it, and I'm like, I have to add that to the list. It was so, so good. So, my first book is The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. And I'll just jump right into the summary. Somewhere out beyond the edge of the universe, there is a library that contains an infinite number of books, each one the story of another reality. One tells the story of your life as it is, along with another book for the other life you could have lived if you had made a different choice at any point in your life. While we all wonder how our lives might have been, what if you had the chance to go to the library and see for yourself? Would any of these other lives truly be better? Nora Seed finds herself faced with this decision, faced with the possibility of changing her life for a new one, following a different career, undoing old breakups, realizing her dreams of becoming a glaciologist or a professional Olympic swimmer. She must search within herself as she travels through the Midnight Library to decide what is truly fulfilling in life and what makes it worth living in the first place. What an interesting concept for a book. I love it. So this book, if you want to read a book to feel all the feelings, I highly recommend reading this book. It's just really, really, really good. And a fun fact about myself, I rate books... If a book just really touches me and I just really enjoy it, I will say, man, I wish I had written this book because that is how close I feel to this book. It's almost like, oh, I wish I had wrote this. So that book made the list of books I wish I had written. It's just a funny list I have. Sounds like it's high praise, though. Yes, yes. And so, like, you know, it was just so good. And, like, it shines a light on mental illness and it just, it's just really, really good. And so just to go into a little more detail and before I do that, I do just want to say this book does talk about some sensitive subjects. So if you are, you know, prone to being triggered or anything like that, don't want to hear that, you know, you may want to mute or skip ahead as I go into detail. So Nora, the main character, At the very beginning of the book, she attempts to end her life after she just has a really bad day. Her cat dies, she gets fired, and so she makes the decision to end her life. And then she wakes up and she's in this library, and it's full of books, and none of the books have titles on the spines. And so she's like very confused and, you know, lost and scared. And there's a librarian there. And the librarian tells her all of these books are different lives you could have had. And there's just an infinite amount of them because every day we make so many little decisions, even if it's a decision of what time you eat your lunch, you know, there's just so many different lives. And so she's like, pick a new life if you want. You can go in, pick a book, read it. If you like that life, you can stay there. If you don't like it, you can come back and pick another life. And so Nora, that's what she does. So as the summary said, she goes and sees, well, what would it, what would my life have been like if I had pursued glaciology? And so she goes to that life and she almost gets killed by a polar bear. She becomes an Olympic swimmer. She becomes a rock star. She just does all these different things. And slowly throughout the book, it was really fun to like walk along her journey with her mental health because she suffers from depression and anxiety. And so it was just really neat to see her, like basically she figures out you can't have happiness without unhappiness. Like the two will not exist without the other. And so she figures that out as she goes along trying out these different lives. And some are like really amazing. Some are boring. Some are just 
weird. Like she just, you know, and she figures out that there's a reason for her decisions because in some of the lives, her choices affect other people who she cares about. And so like there's one life she goes to and someone very important to her, they're no longer living in that life because of her decisions. And so she's like, no, you know, this life is perfect, but I don't want to live in a world without them. So it was just really good. And it was just beautiful and meaningful. And I just really, really enjoyed it. I follow the author on Instagram, actually, and he is just so inspiring. And he's, he's been talking about writing another book. And so I really hope he does because I really enjoyed this book. It's on my to be read pile. But I think I'm going to have to bump it up. Yeah, you're going to have to. It's it so, wonderful. so good. I read it a couple months ago. It was a really interesting concept and it's such a quick read too, which I really liked because yeah. I have so many books on my reading list. If I see something that's just a nice quick read and really engaging read, I'm like, all right, move that one up. <laughs> Knock one list. But yeah, I really liked the concept of that one. I know a lot of people have been checking it out and enjoying it, so... It's really popular right now. So Jordan, you have one of my favorite books from last <laughs> year that you're going to talk about. Yes, and it's it's been a while since I've read it, but I'm planning on reading it again this year. I actually enjoyed it so much when I checked it out from the library that I bought it. Like I just had to have it. I had to own it and look at it every day. Gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. I said that some of yeah. your previously published books are being re-released with new covers. Oh, wow. So yeah. I'm hoping that she'll get more readers because the cover for Mexican Gothic certainly influenced me into picking it up. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it has other people too. So I'm hoping repackaging her older books means that she'll just gain mm -hmm. more readers. Yeah, I get a lot of people who haven't worked in a library who are like, oh, you know, I bet you hate it when people, you know, judge a book by its cover. Like, I'm like, no, we all do it. Yeah. I do it. <laughs> well, publishing companies spend a lot of money to have those covers designed so that you do gravitate towards it and you want mm -hmm. to pick it up. And in yeah. this era of Bookstagram, yeah. I mean, publishers would be bonkers not to invest a lot of care in how yeah. they're packaging their books. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, my husband yeah. will tease me because, like, we'll be shopping. Well, not lately, but we'll be shopping, and I'll see, and I'll be like, no, that I don't like that cover. And he'll be like, it could be a really good book. And I'm like, I get that, but I don't like the cover. And I'll say to him, it's no different than seeing food, like watching a commercial for a restaurant and they like Olive Garden, they show those like pasta dishes and it's like, yeah, they make them look that good. So people will come in and buy their food. So it's the same thing with a book cover. That was definitely what drew me to this book. And I'm glad that it did. So I really loved it. And I have uh, the synopsis right okay. here. Hopefully I don't butcher the pronunciation too much. This is Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. After receiving a frantic letter from her newlywed cousin begging for someone to save her from a mysterious doom, Noemi Taboda heads to High Place, a distant house in the Mexican countryside. She's not sure what she will find. Her cousin's husband, a handsome Englishman, is a stranger and Noemi knows little about the region. Noemi is an unlikely rescuer. She's a glamorous debutante and her chic gowns and perfect red lipstick are more suited for cocktail parties than amateur sleuthing. But she's also tough and smart with an indomitable will and she is not afraid. Not of her cousin's new husband who is both menacing and alluring. Not of his father, the ancient patriarch who seems to be fascinated by Noemi. And not even the house itself which begins to invade Noemi's dreams with visions of blood and doom. Her only ally in this inhospitable abode is the family's youngest son. Shy and gentle, he seems to want to help her, but might also be hiding dark knowledge of his family's past. For there are many secrets behind the walls of High Place. 
The family's once colossal wealth and faded mining empire kept them from prying eyes, but as Noemi digs deeper, she unearths stories of violence and madness. And Noemi, mesmerized by the terrifying yet seductive world of High Place, may soon find it impossible to ever leave this enigmatic house behind. I definitely recommend if you're a fan of Gothic literature in general, I know I am, like Bram Stoker, Daphne du Maurier, and so which are a lot of more classic authors from like 19th century. So we don't really see a whole lot of traditional Gothic writing nowadays. So when I came across this and I opened it up and started reading it, like, oh yes, this is the stuff I like and nobody writes it anymore. So it just really pulled me in. And my main things that I read are fantasy and horror. So I'm really into kind of the nuances of those genres. And I would say that I would classify this as a horror novel. I have a blog outside of work where I write about horror films and horror novels, and I did a best horror novels of 2020 post, and this was one of them. There are just enough scares in it that even got to me, and like my tolerance is pretty high at this point. I follow but, her on Twitter. Mm -hmm. and she is very adamant that it is a horror novel, that it is not fantasy. It's definitely horror. I thought mm -hmm. it was interesting. She actually based the town near mm -hmm. the creepy old house. It's yeah. a place in Mexico, and she said some mm -hmm. of her family came there. So it is an actual mining town that English people came over and settled. And oh. the Mexican, yeah. that, you know, the native people do the icky mining part, but she said cool. it was fascinating researching mm -hmm. it, and I think she even posted some photos on her Twitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. one of the things I love about gothic literature is just like how the setting becomes like another character, and I mm -hmm. think she really nailed that because High Place is, isn't very nice. Shana and I have talked about this because Shana read it recently. I read it, yeah. And did you really? I would have I read did. It. It made me feel icky. Did you do this for a lot of the pages? I know you Honestly, no. I think I was so disgusted with the house, mm -hmm. and I didn't have room for fear. I was like, this is gross. So the big thing in this book is mushrooms. And at first, you know, before I read this book, I was like, oh, mushrooms, you know, whatever. I didn't really think about it, but the way that they appear and the role they play in the book, I'm just like, ew, I don't, I don't like them. Yeah, it's like totally normal for uh, Noemi in her room. There's like black mold on the wall and she's just like, the black mold, that's gross looking. And I'm like, mm -mm. <laughs> I would not sleep in there. Usually in Gothic literature, like the setting represents like what's going on with the characters or the family. You know, like it's just deteriorating and it's not what it used to be. And also it just occurred to me rereading the synopsis. This has a lot of similar elements to Crimson Peak by Guillermo del Toro, which is also one of the few gothic pieces that have come out in the last however many decades. That are mainstream, at least. I'm sure there are a lot more that I would like to learn about. If you're a fan of Crimson Peak, which also had the mining which was a big similarity, and then like the house and the family and the secrets and all that stuff, definitely pick up Mexican Gothic. It's very similar, but definitely like its own thing going on as well. Yeah. All right, I'm going to lighten the tone up from all this <laughs> decay. So my first pick is Spoiler Alert by Olivia Dade, which is an absolute love letter to nerds. Two people who write fanfic become writing buddies and friends when they bond over their love for a Game of Thrones type television show. So what April the woman doesn't know is that her online friend is actually Marcus, the star of the TV show. So he uses his fanfic to write what he wishes the writers for the show were writing for his character, but he can't mm -hmm. let anybody know who he is because that would violate all sorts of terms in his contract mm -hmm. and he'd end up getting fired. Mm -hmm. So... April posts a photo of herself cosplaying one of the show's characters. She doesn't tell people that she cosplays because 
she's plus size and she's afraid that she'll get a lot of mean trolley kind of responses. So it blows up on social media and yes, there are lots of body positive go girl kinds of comments, but she does get a fair amount of trolling. And Marcus sees that and invites her on a date, basically. He asks her out for dinner. And she's like, oh, it's probably a publicity stunt, but why the heck not? He's gorgeous. He's the actor on this show that she loves. Well, while they're at dinner, he figures out she's his writing buddy. And now he's like, oh, no. If I tell her, what if it gets out that I've been writing all this really critical stuff about the show? I'll lose my job. My career will be over. But he really likes her, and he's like, I feel like I can't keep this part of my life hidden from her. So it's all the, what do you do? When does he tell her? Does he ever tell her? Plus, because he's on this role that's very physical, he's very into a strict diet and lots of exercising, and she's not. Mm -hmm. And so, like, he says things like, I'm going to go for a run. Do you want to come with me? And he's doing it just to be nice, and she's like, oh, is the implication that I'm fat and you need me to run so that I get skinny? And he's like, no, that's not what I meant. But it's interesting to watch that dialogue and the interplay between the two of them. So lots of funny moments. I mean, if you're into cons, cosplaying, fanfic, it's a lot of fun. And I cannot wait for her second mm -hmm. book to come out later this year. I'm really, really looking forward to it. Plus, mm -hmm. I have to say, as a romance reader, nice to see more plus size women as you were talking i just added it to my to read list because <laughs> i've been trying to diversify like the kind of stuff that i read just to try something new because usually when i try a genre that i don't normally read i end up really loving it so why not give it a try oh, so but yeah that sounds like something i'd like because i love like you know like fandoms and oh, yeah. uh, the creativity that is inspired by different fandoms and shows and books and stuff like that. So I think that's one I, I would enjoy. Well, yeah. and if you're a Game of Thrones fan, mm -hmm. you can tell oh, yeah. that the author really has some strong opinions about what the writers on that show did because she's making it very evident how she feels by, you know, the fanfic and some of the other things that happen. Oh, cool. <laughs> and there's also a little bit of rock nerdery because April is a geologist. Yeah. Yeah, that one is on my list. And actually, I had it when it first came out. I was like early on the holds list and I didn't have time to get to it and it had hold. So I had to send it back. So I haven't read that one yet, but it is on my list. It's a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to seeing what she does next. And I agree with you. It's nice to read stuff that show diversity for couples you know romance because it's not cookie cutter right in real life so why would the book personify it that way so well and i love it that he's the one that's very wrapped up in maintaining his appearance because that's his livelihood right yeah so he has to care and we get the man being the one about oh man i gotta worry about my skincare routine and how my yep. looks and oh am i going gray oops that was a lot of fun <laughs> Sheena, i think your next one is it the second one in the series Yes, it's the it's the Brown Sisters by Talia Hibbert, and we got a good flow going here because it also shows diversity in couples and just in characters in general. Talia Hibbert, that is like her biggest thing when she writes her romance, which I really love about her, and I love her characters. So yes, my next one is Take a Hint, Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert. And it is the second one. The first one. Sorry, I yes. didn't interrupt. But no, 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 no. I love the first one. The first one, it actually, it's Get a Life, Chloe Brown. And it got me into reading romance this past year because, yes, it was the first one I read because I saw, I saw it, I saw the cover and I was like, you know, that looks lighthearted and fun with everything going on. I just needed a happy ending. And sure enough, it was, and it, it's such a great book. They're great characters. And I was so excited to read Danny's story. And then the third one just came out, which is Act Your Age, Eve Brown. So she's yes. the third Brown sister. And that'll be the end of the Brown sisters. But you don't have to read them in order. So it's not one of those books. You can read in any order you want. So Danny Brown knows what she wants. Professional success, 
academic renown, and an occasional role in the hay to relieve all that career-driven tension. But romance? Been there, done that, burn the t-shirt. Danny seeks out the universe itself to find her the perfect friend with benefits, with absolutely no love and romance. The universe gives Danny what she asked for, or did it. When the grumpy and mysterious ex-rugby player, Zafir, rescues Danny from a workplace fire drill gone wrong, Danny pays attention to what the universe has dropped right into her lap. But the universe likes to play its games. When a video of Zafir carrying Danny out of a burning building goes viral, the world becomes highly interested in the cute couple. Hashtag Dr. Rugby starts the trend, and Zaf begs Danny to play along to help his sports charity for kids earn some nice publicity, and he doesn't mind the company of Miss Danny Brown. Danny agrees to be his pretend girlfriend with conditions, fake a relationship in public, seduce one another behind the scenes. The trouble is, Zafir is secretly a hopeless romantic, and he is determined to not let Danny slip from his grasp. Suddenly, Danny starts to feel things for Zafir, and their relationship becomes more complex than she planned for. Has her wish to the universe backfired, or is the universe just waiting for her to take a hint? <laughs> I love the summary. Mm -hmm. It sounds um, like a lot of fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And what I love about Danny, so she is bisexual. And so it was nice to see like a character that they date men, they date women. And so she ends up dating Zafir. And Danny is so anti romance. It's almost like she's allergic to it. And then Zafir is this tall, muscular, buff ex rugby player. And he reads romance novels. Like, he loves romance novels. So, you know, they end up in this relationship. And the thing I love about Talia Hibbert's novels as well, not only does she show diversity, but she also shines a light on, like, illnesses or disabilities. So Danny suffers from anxiety. And you wouldn't know that because she comes off as this, like, strong, independent woman vibe, and she just doesn't give a crap. But she does struggle with it, and she struggles with, like, opening up. And it was nice to see, like, rather than them, like, fighting, because, you know, sometimes you think, like, that's a bad thing to have anxiety. Like, Zafir, like, he, like, comforts her, and they talk it out, and they're just very open with each other in their relationship. So it was just kind of nice to read something that's, it just feels like more real life, because everyone has problems, and when you are in a relationship with somebody, your problems are going to mingle, and rather than letting it blow up, talk about it. I mean, it can blow up, too, but talk about it after. Right? <laughs> it's life, and her characters, too, the three Brown sisters, they are not like cookie cutter they're for one they're they're black women so they've got this like strong you know persona and they were raised by a strong grandmother so grandma's rule yeah and danny like she has short hair and she dyes it a different color like every day so like talia hibbert's books are just very very diversified and i love it so you should read it yeah can't wait for it <laughs> Okay, Jordan, you're up next. What do you have for us? So the second book I picked out, I believe is pronounced Piranesi by Susanna Clark. Uh, this one's more in the fantasy category. It's one of those books I think is more of an experience reading it than just a straight story, if that makes sense. But I have the summary right here. So Piranesi's house is no ordinary building. Its rooms are infinite. Its corridors endless, its walls are lined with thousands upon thousands of statues, each one different from all the others. Within the labyrinth of halls, an ocean is imprisoned. Waves thunder up, the, up staircases, rooms are flooded in an instant. But Piranesi is not afraid. He understands the tides as he understands the pattern of the labyrinth itself. He lives to explore the house. There is one other person in the house, a man called The Other, who visits Piranesi twice a week and asks for help with research into a great and secret knowledge. That's in all caps, proper nouns. But as Piranesi explores, evidence emerges of another person, 
and a terrible truth begins to unravel, revealing a world beyond the one Peter Nessie has always known. I was drawn to this book. Again, amazing cover. And it was actually a very simple cover, but it just really, really stood out to me. But I've always been a fan of different types of mythology, whether Greek, Norse mythology, all different kinds. So I'm finding out more and more with reading different books, how much mythology is actually out there. It really had that vibe. So if you're really into Greek mythology and the stories associated with that, it was such a great one. And it was surprisingly had some disturbing elements to it by the end of it, which I, of course, did not dislike because that's kind of my thing. Um, but it was just, it was such an interesting book and it's like, you think you know what's going on, but it's not. And then you think you have it figured out then. And then there's so, I know we've talked about Gillian Flynn before, how she kind of does that with her books, totally different genre. But it's one of those things like you get to a certain point, you're like, oh, I have it figured out. You know, I, I'm good. I got this figured out. And then just at the very end, they throw something else in there and you're not ready. So it's one of those books. So I really, really enjoyed it. That's another one I plan to read again. Well, that one, isn't it fairly short compared to her first book? Yeah. I, more stop. I haven't read any of her other books, actually. This, so this is my introduction to this author as well. But yeah, again, it's a, it's a quick read. It's just, it's very different. Here, Nessie is just a really, really fun character. If we are looking at Greek mythology, he's kind of like the Hermes character, very enthusiastic and just kind of bopping around and helping everybody. And yeah, he's a great character. It's just a very interesting book to read and experience. And, you know, like no matter what genres you're really into, I think there's something for everyone. Good. So when you for I haven't read it, mm -hmm. you said Piranesi. I was like, I thought Circe, yeah. Madeline Miller. And so then when I heard you mm -hmm. say he, I was like, like already <laughs> I thought this is good, you know, no. So even just from the title, yeah, and I love Madeline Miller. I've mm -hmm. now read everything that she's ever published, and now I'm just waiting until she publishes more. I love modern mythology. I know we have a few coming in, new books right mm -hmm. now, that are kind of based on that, and I just, I just love it. What um, I really liked about the young adult fiction book, Strange the Dreamer, which I told mm -hmm. Jordan yep. she was since she's our floater, she was here a lot when I read that. And I was like, you have to read this, Jordan. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God. And yeah. that one had a lot of like the mythology aspect. And I love it. I love mm -hmm. those books. Yeah. yeah. Lainey Taylor is an amazing writer. Lainey mm -hmm. Taylor. I wish I was her. She's so good. So my next pick is The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. And what a fun book to read. Again, it's got a gorgeous cover. I will not be afraid to admit that, yes, the cover is part of what drew me to it. But yeah. I've read a lot of her previous books. She also writes under her real first name, Victoria. She writes young adult books. So I've read several of those too. Really enjoy her writing. So this starts in 18th century rural France. Addie's grandmother has warned her about the darkness and not to let it in and definitely do not make bargains with it. But as an impetuous young woman, Addie doesn't listen. And when the darkness offers her immortality, she takes it. What she hadn't counted on was no one being able to remember her. She goes home after she makes this bargain and her own parents don't recognize her. Her grandmother doesn't recognize her. She goes into town. The townspeople don't recognize her. So as soon as she is out of sight, so even if somebody closes their eyes, or she walks around a corner, people totally forget about her. She can't even leave her mark. Like anything she writes disappears. At one point, there's a scene where she spills a bottle of red wine across a white tablecloth. And even as she watches, it disappears. So nobody remembers her. So the darkness keeps coming to her and saying, you're ready to end it all, right? You're ready to, to die. This is a terrible existence and you don't want it, and she's bound and determined that she's not going to let him win. So she always says, nope, I'm fine. And then in current day, she's in a bookstore, and she steals things because nobody remembers her. 
<laughs> so that's how she exists, right? She'll walk in, grab it, and as soon as she's out the door, they have no idea. So she goes into a bookstore and she's going to steal books and the guy sees her and talks to her and she's like no big deal i'm out the door and he's not going to call the cops he'll forget about me she goes back in a week later and he's like you were the one who came in to steal <laughs> he was like oh my god somebody has remembered me this it's is a me. man <laughs> of course yeah prince charming no. <laughs> so there she is and the darkness has been courting her over the centuries because now she's strong-willed enough that he finds her defiance kind of attractive. Like he asks her out for dinner and kind of a datey sort of thing. And she keeps saying no, which I imagine makes it all the more attractive, right? You'll want what you can't have if you're yeah. the devil. It's super interesting because how do you have a relationship when you're used to people constantly forgetting and now somebody remembers you? So yeah. super good book. It has been all over Bookstagram and I think it's interesting. People are either like, Yes, I love it. Or, oh my gosh, the pacing in this is too slow and I hate it. So I think depending on if you're willing to give it a little bit of time, because it's a lot of mood writing in the beginning, not a lot of super huge action scenes when what you're doing is thinking about how it would feel to never leave your mark anywhere and for nobody to remember you. I liked it. thought it was a lot of fun. Yeah, everyone I know who's read it, they were just raving about it. Mm -hmm. So I may have to give it a try. I love it. Well, and she writes such beautiful things. There's a fantasy element to it because Addie's living forever, but that's it. I mean, it's not like there's magic and things in it. Her other books tend to be a lot more traditional fantasy, but even those, she breaks stereotypes all the time. You get a lot of morally ambiguous characters, mm -hmm. like a darker shade of magic. I, mm, yeah, I'm just cool. a super big fan of the writing. Yeah, that one's been on my list. That's another one. I was early on the hold list because I overestimated my reading capability and I didn't have time to get to it when it when it was and someone else wanted it. So I didn't have time and I've tried to put it on hold on Libby and I've been waiting to get my hands on that one. I so. do that too though. I'll check something out and I'm like, I'll get to this. And then I don't. And if I yeah. know other people want it, I'm like, oh, I feel such guilt. I must return I this know. and I'll return it later. Yeah. I know. And all of my holds, whether in the branches or on Libby Overdrive, they all come in at once. Yes. Like, I'm like, I don't have time. I wish I did. Yes. So I, I have to like pick and choose basically by book cover, which one I really like. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Or sometimes yeah. I'm like, well, this has so many pages, I'll take the shorter mm -hmm. one, and then maybe I can get back to the longer one. Yeah, I do uh, that too. That one sounds amazing. And uh, like, I remember it by the title, but I honestly did not remember like the summary. So you saying it, I'm sitting here like, I didn't remember that. It sounds so, so cool, like all over again. <laughs> so oh, good. You discover new things. Yeah. Okay, so Shana, your last book was also yes. one of my most favorite reads of last yes. year. Yes, oh. Alex E. Harrow, Queen. Yeah, so her most recent book, my last pick, is The Once and Future Witches, which is such a cool title. And the cover on this one was just gorgeous. And what drew me to her first book, The 10,000 Doors of January, was the cover. And I'm so glad I picked it up because that was a book where, like The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, either people loved it or they right. hated it. And it was, again, it was the pacing because that book, too, was kind of a little slow to get to action parts. And that's kind of how this one is. But I loved it. So here is the summary. In 1893, there's no such thing thing as witches. There used to be in the wild, dark days before the burnings began, but now witching is nothing but tidy charms and nursery rhymes passed from mother to daughter, hidden workings and small tricks. If the modern woman wants any measure of power, she must find it at the ballot box. But when the Eastwood sisters, Juniper, Agnes, and Bella, join the suffragist of New Salem, they begin to pursue the forgotten words and ways that might turn the women's movement into the witches' movement. 
stalked by shadows and sickness, hunted by forces who will not suffer a witch to vote and perhaps not even to live, the sisters will need to delve into the oldest magics, draw new alliances, and heal the bond between them if they want to survive. So I love this book. What Alex Harrow did was she took the, you know, the concept of witches in Salem, and then she mixed that with before women had the right to vote. And so when women were going on marches and having riots with their signs and everything, like we want to vote, you're going to hear us, our opinions, but then add some witches into that. Okay. And they're not, they're not like, you know, like the, they're like the wicked witch in Wizard of Oz. They're not the pretty one with the pink poofy dress. I forget her name. Linda. Mm -hmm. Yes. They're not that type. They're not like a fairy godmother type of witch. They are witches. And so it was really good. I was just rooting for the three sisters. One of the things I love about books is when each chapter is told from a different character. So it has multiple points of view. And so each chapter was told from a different sister and each sister has their own stuff going on. They had like a rough childhood. And so they were like separated and, you know, had old wounds and traumas that they hadn't addressed yet. And then they come together and address that throughout the book together. And so they each have their own strengths. They each have their own attitudes and personalities. And it was interesting how each chapter that just really came across. I've read books before where, yes, the chapter is a different character, but it doesn't feel like it. So this one was really good. Alex Harrow did an amazing job on that aspect. I think you could even... I'm sorry. It's, no, no, no. I think you could even read those and you wouldn't have to see the chapter heading. Once you got yeah. to know the character, mm-hmm. you do yeah. yes. Work, I think you could not have those and you'd still know she was you would so know. good at crafting such a an obvious voice for each one of them. I really Yeah, like yeah. Them. And so like Juniper, she was my favorite sister. And like I love how Alex Hara writes. She just writes, it's almost like she's singing a song when she writes. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. lyrical. It's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. And so like there were parts for Juniper where it was like Juniper walked into the room and her hair was wild and witchcraft was oozing out of her. I'm not describing it as good as Alex Harrow does, but so so good and it just made you feel as a woman it just made me feel like yes like get it girls <laughs> and i am looking forward to more books from alex harrow i've been reading a lot of her short stories that she wrote and would publish in magazines so like they don't have physical books but she is she's a top author in my opinion so she definitely, definitely she has her own ways and that she was not afraid to use it. I also love that she worked civil rights into the Once and Future Witches, mm-hmm. that the white women and the black women, even though they're both fighting for a lot of the same thing, there's still some tussling and, you know, how do you honor traditions? And so I thought that was a nice, ad- because goodness knows women's suffrage and, you know, not being burnt because you're a witch, those are pretty heavy topics in and of themselves. So I was amazed that she managed to work that in too. And yet yeah. I, I never felt like it was a, I'm writing this as a cause. I mean, it never lost the entertainment factor, which right. I enjoyed. I mean, I, and that yeah. ending, I don't know about you, but it made me cry. I was Yes, it that tore ending. my heart out and just ripped it to pieces. Yeah, it, just, just such a great book. And like like you said, I love she had all the aspects of just a good, for her story, she hit like every nail on the head. She had race, suffrage, you know, women's rights. And she even had a little bit of like sexuality, survival, just, you know, one of the sisters, she kind of has it a little rougher and she still, every day, she just, she goes to work. She's a survivor. And there was even some homophobia in there. I mean, she just really shines a light on so many different things in her books. And I love it. I love it. I'm sorry she's not going to have a novel coming out this year, but there is no, in the fall, she's doing a retelling of, I think it's Sleeping Beauty, right? Spindle yeah, Spindle. I think it's co- yeah, a spindle splinter. Yes, I think it's going to be a novella, maybe. So I think I have multiple fairy tale retellings. So gosh, she's so good. Yeah, I read The Once and Future Witches around Halloween last mm-hmm. year. And I agree, she has so many 
elements happening, but she blends them all so well. And one of the things I love about the way she wrote the characters was actually even just in the first few chapters where she would introduce the sister and mm -hmm. say she was born in this place on this type of weather. Like from the very beginning, we get some kind of abstract sense of who they are. And their witchcraft, you know, like, because they all have it in them. All women do is what I love about this book. It was, and like, there's a point in the book where they're trying to track down like a very particular spell. And so they find out it's in the nursery rhymes. Our mothers and grandmothers sang to us. So she's just, mm -hmm. just that creativity. Like who can come up with that? That's so creative. Well, in her reasoning for why women's clothing doesn't have pockets, which I know I've cursed about, you know, why do dresses not have pockets? Yeah. And the fact that it was men did that so that women couldn't have the workings for witchcraft in them. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah. I'm like, yes, pockets, pockets is a slap in the face to the yeah. patriarchy. Yes, I'm there for that. Yes. And it was so cool in the book, like, because they do have pockets, the sisters, and like when they're getting ready to do a spell, they'll have like, I don't know, a piece of thistle and cinnamon and they'll like crush it in their pocket and then they'll do their spell. And I was just, I was entranced the entire book. I was just beautiful. Yes. All right, Jordan, what's your last pick for us? All right. So my last one is called Ghosts of Harvard by Francesca Saratella. This book also dealt with some sensitive topics that do get kind of dark in the book, but overall I think it was handled very well and respectfully in the story. So I have the synopsis. Cadence Archer arrives on Harvard's campus, desperate to understand why her brother Eric, a genius who developed paranoid schizophrenia, took his own life there the year before. Losing Eric has left a black hole in Katie's life, and while her decision to follow in her brother's footsteps threatens to break her family apart, she is haunted by questions of what she might have missed, and there's only one place to find answers. As Katie struggles under the enormous pressure at Harvard, she investigates her brother's final year armed only with a blue notebook of Eric's cryptic scribblings. She knew he had been struggling with paranoia, delusions, and illusory enemies, but what tipped him over the edge? With her suspicions mounting, Katie herself begins to hear voices, seemingly belonging to three ghosts who walked the university's hallowed halls, or huddled in its slave quarters. Among them is a person whose name has been buried for centuries, and another whose name mankind will never forget. Does she share Eric's illness, or is she tapping into something else? Katie doesn't know how or why these ghosts are contacting her, but as she is drawn deeper into their world, she believes they're moving her closer to the truth about Eric, even as keeping them secret isolates her further. Will listening to these voices lead her to one voice she craves, her brother's, or will she follow them down a path to her own destruction? So what drew me to this book initially, it had ghosts in the title, so you know, that drew me in. And it just, like reading about it and then reading the actual book and confirming this, it just reminds me so much of the college town where I lived for four years. I finished up my bachelor's degree and went straight through and got my master's degree at Ohio University in Athens, which is about two and a half hours from Claremont County. And I haven't been there in over a year because of the pandemic and the lockdowns. So reading this book and, you know, it's her first semester at college and all the collegiate buildings and the bricks and the local coffee shops and the library and I was like oh I miss it so I really enjoyed it in fact one of Ohio University's nicknames is Harvard on the Hawking the author Francesca Saratella she graduated from Harvard so she's recounting her experience there and it's another one of those stories where the setting is so important and the character's interaction with the setting is so important. So it's very well written, really great control over the, the narrative and keeping the story going. So dark academia has been a big thing recently. Deadly Education by Naomi Novik, My even path. like 
by Lee Bardugo. Yeah, absolutely. Even like television, there's been some dark academia. So I know that's a big thing right now. So if you're into that, if you want to learn some more, read some more stories kind of in that vein, this is a really good one to check out. Or if you just enjoy historical fiction, mystery, and or ghost stories, this has a lot of that. And that's another thing about this book. It has so many layers. Like you get that, the personal difficulties that Katie has returning to this place that has such a negative history with her family. And she's trying to not only learn what happened to her brother when they had no answers at the time and for such a long time afterward, but she's also, you know, trying to be a college student and do her own thing and figure out what she wants to do. And now she has ghosts talking to her and now there's some conspiracy on campus. So there are so many layers to the story and it was so engaging. I would finish a chapter or I'd be in the middle of a chapter and say, okay, when I finish this, I'm going to put it down and go do something else. And then as soon as I finish it, it's like, no, oh, one more, maybe two. Well, that's it's great. A that's a sign of a really engaging, entrancing mm -hmm. book, I think, when you can't yes. put it down, even mm -hmm. though you know you should go to bed or wash oh, yeah. the dishes or whatever. But the fact that you <laughs> do that whole internal bargaining with yourself I'm just going to read to the end of this chapter. No, wait, maybe just one more chapter. Yeah, I, I yeah. always find myself, whenever I'm reading a good book, I'll be, like, laying in bed reading, and my eyes, like, I'm not even reading anymore, but I just want to keep going, and, like, my eyes are, like, screaming at me, like, we're going to shut and fall asleep on you. <laughs> So I have to like force myself to put the book down. I love books like that. Yeah, and it was funny, like this book's actually a pretty hefty book, but you don't really notice it because the writing is very natural, it's very engaging. She meets a lot of different characters and they all are real and unique. And so just overall really great book and it doesn't go all in on the ghost thing if anyone's concerned about that it's just it's one of the many many layers of the story that bring it all together sounds good so my last pick is the house in the cerulean sea by tj clune and i've been encouraging other people to read it by describing it as the book equivalent of a soft warm cashmere blanket it just envelops you in warmth and the happiness. It was the perfect book to read during a pandemic. Lots of feel-good stuff in it. So the main character, Linus, leads a very quiet life with his cantankerous cat in his record collection. That's how he goes wild listening to records. He works for the government as a caseworker at the Department in Charge of Magical Youth. So that is the only true fantasy aspect is that some people are born with magic and the government in his country is not having that. So when children are found to be magical, they're taken away from their parents and they're set to live in these homes. So he inspects the homes that the children with magical powers are placed in. And because of his diligence, he receives a special assignment. He's sent to visit an island and observe both the magical children being kept there and their keeper, Arthur Parnassus. So this is all of the kids who are super magical that they're afraid are going to do something. So they put them all in this very remote island. But then he gets there and it's not exactly what he thought it was going to be. His first introduction to one of the very magical children is this gnome. And she's very into gardening and she wants to tell him all about the exciting things about her shovel and how the seed catalogs are coming in and she's all excited about it. And he's like, maybe these aren't the terrible, awful, magical creatures I thought they were going to be. Although he does rethink that because one of them is an eight-year-old antichrist. He talks about all the bad thoughts he has in his head, and sometimes that makes Linus a little wary. But there's a lot of humor in it, a lot of found family. And because the children are magical, people in the nearby town are super afraid of them. They get the kids together and they're like, let's go have an outing and we'll have ice cream. And some of the townspeople are throwing rocks at them and they're just being terrible. And so Linus has to question, boy, have I really been doing this awful thing? Is the government really terrible? Maybe magical people aren't so bad after all. 
So mm -hmm. anyway, it's got a delightful happy ending. So you know up front there will be no having your heart ripped out by what happens. It's so happy and warm and I loved it. I could not talk about it to people enough. Yeah, my my copy of the ebook just came in yesterday. So yay. I know what I'm doing this weekend. So. Yes. I hope you yeah. Okay. Mine's Love still it. on hold. I'm still waiting. Well, I hope <laughs> you both enjoy the heck out of it when you get the chance to read. I even yeah. got my mom. My mom is like a domestic thriller, mystery, literary, fiction mm -hmm. kind of person. And I was like, this is a happy read. I bet you'll like it. And she did. So Ooh. Now, is that one? That's not a JF, is it? it? I don't think so. I know he writes some young adult things. Well, when I saw the cover... It just to me, it looked like a juvenile cover. And then when I looked it up, I was like, oh, I love that cover. Yeah, so I fun. do. I love it. Mm -hmm. Although, to be honest, there isn't anything in it that, depending on a kid's grade level, there isn't anything objectionable. Yeah. It would just be the language, cool. you know, like the vocabulary. So thank you both for sharing some of your favorite books from 2020 with me. This has been a lot of fun. I love that we overlap in some areas and some areas you pick books that I never would have picked, but I love hearing about them. Thank you to our listeners and our viewers for joining us. Listeners, remember to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any upcoming episodes of the Book Lovers Podcast. Viewers, subscribe to the Claremont Library YouTube channel for this and other great library content. Thank you for joining us and happy reading.